So I don't see anything. I hope you can see me and you can see the slides. So some, some words up front. So why did I make this talk? How did it come to, to be a talk? Um, my day-to-day -day job is uh, information security management. And in that job, I always have to explain um, security problems to people who decide what to do. Like, we have a security bug here, what should we do? We have a vulnerability, what should we do? So, this is not everything, but this is a very important part. And in January, we had Malta on Spectre, and like everybody was, oh God, we are going to die. I mean, we are going to die, but just not now. And I tried to explain them what the problem was, and if it was a problem, and for whom it is a problem. Um, and I found it's difficult to explain the actual problem without some background. And so I decided to provide the background to people who are normal people. I'm, I'm sorry, you are probably not normal people by this definition, because most of you will have opened a computer in their lifetime, or two, uh, even wrote a, program, a programmer or two, so this is more like people who manage IT, more, uh, normal people, not developers. But uh, the talk is something for everybody, uh, because it will shed some light on the, the other side. You know, the people who look at you with blank stares when you explain them what Meltdown Inspector is. So I can skip over that slide. Uh, yes, uh, I look better. Um, I do IT, I've been doing that for my whole life, uh, and I still like that. And the interesting you know, position in IT for me is between deciders and IT. So, but, okay, as I said, Melton Inspector is a problem. If you have a problem, um, you have to do something that doesn't work anymore. So first, what is the problem? Okay. Processes, that is not like business process, but uh, operating system processes must be isolated from each other. This is like a primary um, idea behind operating systems. So what does it mean? Um, you don't want this app to read the data of that app. You don't want this browser tab to read the data of that browser tab. You don't want these VMs to read the data of those VMs. Okay, so this is a, a very fundamental uh, view on, on, on how computers work, especially in the cloud environment. Or you don't want process A to read data on process B. And you, you, you see the, the black gap in the middle? Uh, that, that's a security boundary. You don't see it, but it's there. And Melton and Spectre break down that barrier. And this is a problem. There are some good sides to Melton and Spectre. Um, and I will come to those. So the first good thing is, or the bad thing, that depends on your system. If your security strategy depends on this boundary, then you have a problem. If it doesn't depend on this boundary, you're fine. You know, the, this one here, it has an operating system and maybe uh, processes running on it. Melton Inspector is not a problem. Because even if I would be able to execute Melton Inspector tags on here, process isolation is not you know, the primary goal of this thing. The second good thing is cannot directly execute Meltdown Inspector remotely. You have to run code on the CPU. Unfortunately, JavaScript is also code that runs on the CPU. And so I will give you now what often is called a management summary. So what is Meltdown? Um, well, the end result is programs can read memory they should not be able to read. It affects all modern CPUs, 
Yes, I know some CPUs are not affected, but you know Intel, AMD, uh, X, uh, 86, um, they are all affected. What is the attack vector? Uh, it's out of order execution and uh, cache timing for exfiltration. What are the fixes? I will maybe highlight them uh, later on. Uh, the important thing is the fixes need the processor either to be re redesigned or the operating system to drop some crucial performance optimizations, namely um, they uh, are effective uh, doing syscalls. And so they have two bad consequences. First is performance. Okay, that's bad. Uh, what's even worse is uh, the fix is in the memory management, and memory, mem memory management is inherently optimized code uh, in all operating systems, and it's very, very difficult you know, to, to turn around that, to grab it and put it inside out. So how bad is Meltdown? It's bad. Spectre goes a bit, it's a family of attacks. It has, um, program can, programs can read memory not only from other programs, but also from the hypervisor if they run in the VM. It also affects all CPUs. Uh, it's, the fixes are recompiling all the programs, which might be difficult. For example, here this, uh, nobody has source code for that. Recompiling is difficult. And uh, updating an operating system or a system that is running, like doing business work, uh, with a change set of 100%, probably you know, could be difficult. The vector is speculative execution. I will show you the differences uh, in this talk. So is this good, these two slides, are they good management summaries? Any ideas? Okay, they are really, really bad. Well, they are good for you, because you, you know understand, you understand most of the words, maybe even all words. Your memory, uh, your management understands bad and very bad. <laughs> and what's even worse is, you tell them you're going to die, but you don't tell them how to prevent that, or when, or w what the actual problem for them is. So, we're going to play a game. The uh, threat o meter. The basic idea is, we have systems on the left side, the uh, green ones, that are low-risk systems for Meltdown Inspector, meaning that either process isolation is not a problem, like not a security um, building block, or running untrusted code is already the worst case. Because if, if, if you run untrusted code and it's the worst case, then Meltdown Inspector, it, it can't get worse than worst case. The red side, high-risk systems, uh, systems that are inherently vulnerable, um, and where an attack is very likely, and where process isolation is important. So, let's play again. Where would public cloud go? It's probably high-risk, yes, <laughs> because it runs untrusted code by design. Database server. I heard medium. I would even say low risk for two reasons. You normally don't want uh, untrusted code on your database server. So that would be already the worst case. And the protection of database servers normally is quite good because they're buried behind like two firewalls and application server. So mail server. Yes, I know, I don't have icons for mail servers. <laughs> mail servers are also low risk, in my opinion, because, you know, um, Dovecat, Postfix are, you know, really, really major software. They have been uh, audited a lot of times, so the chance that you have execution there is quite low, and, as I said, if you had an execu remote code execution, it would be already the worst case. I'm not talking about Exchange here or other group work systems, um, they can be a different thing. A laptop? L lap laptops are really, you know, bad. You have JavaScript uh, that runs on it and lots of programs. 
Uh, and what is even worse, uh, laptops, you have a company, like 80% of all workers have laptops. Um, you have a lot to patch, and you have a lot of laptops, so you cannot you know, put someone next to the laptop and do that. You have to, to do that in an automated fashion, and if you do that in an automated fashion, it has to work. Uh, you don't want to you know, kill 80% of your workforce um, by you know, disabling their computer. Mobile phones, just the same. Firewalls, I said, nothing should happen there. And if something happens, it's bad enough. So the interesting part, application servers. Any ideas? Okay. Yeah, medium, medium is a good point. I put it in medium, but it's, you know, it depends. Because remote code execution also means code that you download from the internet like libraries. Anybody here is doing a continuous deployment? You might have a problem. So not, not for the old versions, because they are very difficult to, to, to exploit, especially the Spectre. Um, but the new ones are a different beast. So if I was you know, an evil genius, um, I, I would look for a library. You know, small library that's at, at the bottom of the library food chain, so that's included everywhere. And then I would go to the maintainer, the one who you know publishes the the, the artifact to, uh, to to Maven or Node or whatever, and would either give him like a handful of money or show him a picture of a family. I don't know. It depends on the type. Um, and then I would publish publish something that you know waits a few weeks a month or two uh, until I get some spread. Um, and then I would take over some data centers. Because, you know, the, the, the cloud there, um, they run a lot of code, uh, even if it's a private cloud like this one. And if I would be able to attack that, um, that would be devastating for a lot of companies. So the good news is, uh, the old Spectre and Meltdown are more or less patched. So Meltdown uh, is easy to, to exploit, but mostly patched in, in, in most uh, systems. Spectre, the old versions, are very difficult to exploit, um, but the new versions that are coming are probably way easier to exploit. And Intel has announced that the patch arrives in August, so th there's you know opportunity for for someone who wants to do that. So if you wake up in the morning, you're responsible for like a lot of computers, and someone tells you this, so what would you do? I mean, what, what is your patching strategy? I mean, you're smart, you already you know, created your, your, your clusters, and then you would look like cluster uh, for each cluster. The low risk cluster, probably ignored. Because you know, patching probably does more damage than it helps. The high risk cluster, public cloud, I would patch the public cloud uh, even if I had you know, the risk of uh, instabilities. Instabilities, whatever, you know what I mean. But that also means that you need to know what are your IT systems. So big company, small company, it doesn't matter. Um, just think, the, which IT systems do you have at home? And I guarantee that um, you will miss at least two. And now scale that up to like hundreds and thousands of systems, workplace systems, routers, switches. Well, probably not the microwave, not yet. But that's, from the management side, a very challenging thing to do. So the good side for, uh, of, of Melton Inspector was it got attention, uh, it got management attention to a very high level. But it wasn't so bad yet, until yet. So that was the first part. 
like management summary, so the people with the blank stares when you talk to them. This is the part where I tell you how, how did that happen? I mean, was it malice? Were they stupid? What, what happened? And so to make that, imagine you're running a, a, a burger shop. You know, this is your first, your first burger shop. And you, you sell pizza, you sell burgers, you sell coffee. That's it. Customers come in, it's a takeaway, they place the order, and you prepare the order and they leave. So today's grand opening, and you have you know, one waiter, uh, aka CPU core, and one customer is basically one CPU instruction. The order that the customer has, like a burger and a coffee, um, are the micro operations of the CPU instruction. So what are micro operations? Um, CISC, uh, a complex uh, instruction set, CPUs like Intel, break down the complex well, instructions into many small instructions and schedule these. Uh, for example, uh, adding two numbers, there's a special hardware for that. Reading memory into the processor, there's special hardware for that. And so they break that down into you know, small pieces, micro operations. So, and you do the same. You know, you get the, the, the burger and the coffee. And then you prepare what you do. So, and then the customer goes, or in, in CPU speak, the instruction retires. Retiring an instruction means it becomes effective in the real world. We will see there's a you know, shadow economy inside the processor. But first, you know, very first day, you want to play it safe. Play it safe means you get the order and you schedule the micro operations. So first you grill the burger. And then you brew the coffee. And then the customer's done. So what is good? I mean, it's easy. Even a robot can do it. It's very, very easy. What is bad? It's very slow. Why is it slow? You have a lot of resources. You have a pizza oven, you have a burger grill, you have a coffee machine. You don't utilize them. They just stand, sit around there doing nothing. So the next idea is, you get the order, you schedule your micro operations, but this time, you do them in parallel. You know, the burger and the coffee. And then you retire the instruction or give the customer the, his order. This is way, way better because you have, you know, it's twice as fast as the other version because you have a, way, a, a better resource utilization. You can do even better. You can, you know, take the order, and while the order is prepared, you take the next customer. And this lucky customer needs a resource that, that is free, the pizza oven. And so now you're running two instructions in parallel. In this case, this is really good, because you, know, you can't get any faster than that, because you're using all your resources. There's no, no more room for improvement. The next improvement would be like a second oven or a bigger burger grill or whatever. But what, what is really, really important, order is important. So you have to make sure that the yellow, the first customer, gets his order before the green customer. So at, at McDonald's or Burger King, this is probably not that much of an issue. But if you do computers, order is important. You know, I can, you know, grab that chair and sit down, but I shouldn't do it the other way. You know, first sit down and then try to get the chair. That doesn't work. Order is important. Okay, so first order is completed, and then second order. So even more room for improvement. 
We have more burger grills, more pizza ovens, and a better coffee machine. We're still talking about one CPU core. This is not multi-core, multi-CPU, whatever. This is one core, but uh, in, for example, the pizza oven could be the uh, ALU. They're you know, adding numbers. As I said, the CPU has to make sure that the apparent order of instruction stays the same. But if you look at that, um, we have three instructions running in parallel. And the red one, the second one, has to be finished before the green one, the third one. So let, let's look what happens. Okay. The yellow coffee, the red coffee. The yellow burger, the green pizza. Okay. The green order is already done before the, you know, while the red order is still in progress. So this is a problem. This would be a problem if the world would see the micro operations, but fortunately, the CPU takes care of this. It reorders them so that this is seen to the, uh, in, the, in the world, like in the outside. The program sees yellow, red, green. And basically, this is the, this is the, the core problem. I will show you later why. But this optimization on the left um, breaks down when uh, the, the, the yellow um, coffee cup um, is something you do, and in the, in the yellow burger, you, you check if you are allowed to do that. Then you do something before you check that you're allowed to do that. I'll show you. So why did meltdown inspector happen? So accident, malice, incompetence, whatever, did the NSA tell Intel, you know, do that? Or it's just a very, very, very complex system with equally complex site conditions. So I would say it's complex side effects. Um, just to quote Goethe, um, if it can be explained by, by malice and by neglect, it's probably not malice. People do things not because they're evil, most of the time. They do it because it seems right. And what Intel and the other uh, processor companies did was a very, very complex system to get very, very fast processors. This is a special uh, slide for here. Uh, don't show that to you know, the non-technical people, I don't think. Just a quick show of hands. How many of you how, know how uh, an operating system handles memory? Okay, I would say a third. Okay. So this is not the main you know, point of the talk but it shows you how operating system handle memory because this is the way operating systems handle memory and Melton and Spectre are both you know, tied together. As I said, processes are isolated from each other and so is the memory of a process. Like a process is a running program and like the, the blue one at the top uh, cannot access the memory of the green one at the bottom. So each process, I'm talking now about 64-bit uh, uh, operating systems, namely Linux, uh, they have an address room, virtual address room as it is called. So there are different address rooms, both start at zero and both end at uh, 2 to the 64 minus 1. And they are uh, on normal Intel CPUs, like uh, 48 terabytes. So a bit more than you know, what you put inside your computer as uh, uh, RAM. And these, th this memory, it's segmented first um, into pages. Like it's four kilobyte pages on x86. x86 uh, but they also support larger pages, but for the sake of argument, just leave it at 4K. 
And um, the memory space itself for each process is also segmented. There's a user space and there's a kernel space. So the kernel is the operating system. It's, it is allowed to do everything. You know, it, it, it runs basically the computer. The process is not allowed to do anything, everything. That's you know, what the operating system is for. And what the kernel does, it maps its data structures, its memory inside the process of process memory at specific locations. Why does it do that? Performance reasons. I won't go into detail. So I said the process itself, like the program word or uh, Thunderbird, um, does not have the permission to read the kernel memory. Kind of obvious, um, the, the kernel is high privilege and doesn't want to share all its secrets with user space. So we have now seen two error scenarios, um, like, like B and C. B is process A, A accesses memory of process B, and uh, C is process A accesses the kernel memory in its own address room. B is very interesting, because I said each process has its own virtual address room. A, a process cannot even, you know, name an address in process B. It's like missing a, a, a dimension. You can use pointers to say, I want the address 1234, but it's always in your own address room. You cannot say 1234 in process B. So that, that's the, the basics. So both protections are attacked by Meltdown Inspector. Meltdown attacks the protection of the kernel memory. Spectre, you know, just breaks all. Spectre is even worse. Uh, there could be D that is accessing memory of the hypervisor. So I told you that Meltdown allows to access other processes' memory. And now I said you can only access kernel memory. So how does that, you know, fit together, okay, colorful. Um, these are the two processes, and in the middle you have physical memory. And you know the blinking one? This is a mapping, like the blue page is mapped somewhere in physical memory. And you know we have other pages, like this page, it's not mapped at all. So if you would access memory that's located in this page, the processor would fault, it would, and the operating system would probably terminate your process. It's kind of obvious that this must be the case uh, if you think of like 48 terabytes of memory per process. You, know, you, you can't back all that with you know, physical memory. And then you have maybe you know, memory that's paged out to disk. And then you have the red memory, and this is the kernel memory. And the kernel memory is the same everywhere. The same physical pages at the same virtual addresses. So the problem now is the kernel maps all physical addresses inside this virtual address room. So it's a bit nested. So we have a virtual address room. Part of it belongs to the kernel. And the kernel itself says, I want to have access to all physical memory pages, so I map them inside kernel space. So that basically means um, that each you know, physical run page uh, is mapped at least twice, once in the kernel, once in the user space. So again, this is done for performance reasons. But this also means if I can read kernel space, I can read the whole physical memory, and that means I can read all pages that are mapped and not paged out or just not mapped. And this way I can, you know, re read other processes' memory. Okay? So, 
how do I know that? Uh, well, I, I read the documentation. <laughs> um, this is the memory map of uh, Linux with 64 bits and four level page tables. I won't explain page tables right now. Can you see here the, the yellow, yellow one? This is the direct mapping of all physical memory and the blue one at the, at the top, that's your user space. Okay, now I will show you how you know, Meltdown works. I, I will go into detail for Meltdown. I won't go so much into detail for Spectre. Meltdown works in three steps. First, you read a secret from a forbidden address. So, what address? Probably something in the kernel space. Then, you know, you hide away that. Because you do something that's forbidden and the CPU will make sure that this has never have been happened, you know. <laughs> and then you have someone else who, you know, finds that secret. Okay, I already said we have... So how, how do I stash away that? I do that by side channel attack. What is the side channel? When I was like a little kid, so and my mother went to like uh, the opera or the cinema or whatever. I was you know strictly forbidden to watch TV. I mean, a good kid you know, just wouldn't watch TV. Well, but you know, it was me. So I did watch TV, and my mother had like. A, a very, very effective side channel attack on that. Oh, I heard her coming, I switched off the TV, I ran into my bed and pretended to sleep um, and left open two side channels. The TV was warm and the bed was cold. It should have been the other way around. So, so this is not, you know, TVs are not to des designed to be hot. They just happen to be hot when you use them. And so here you have memory, like RAM, physical RAM. All data is stored in RAM, if you work with that, that's a process. And RAM is just very, 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 very slow compared to CPU. You know, fetching one byte from RAM literally takes as long as doing hundreds of things if the CPU already had that memory, that, that data. So like on 100 nanoseconds to get data from RAM, that's, you know, it, it's a good value. It's a few years old, but, you know, for the sake of argument. So explain the picture. There's an address, and in the address there's a value. And so I said, it's very, very slow. So what did clever people do? You know, do something that's faster. Faster is cache. Cache is extremely fast and extremely expensive. That explains why not all your memory is made out of cache. How does it work? The processor reads something. It's not in the cache. You get it from RAM. So 100 nanoseconds later, you have the data. You put it in your cache. And like 103 nanoseconds later, you have the data. Okay. This is not an improvement. It's, you know, it's more complex and it's slower. Um, the, the idea is that you most likely will you know, use the same data value multiple times. Or data like near the data you read. For example, you read an array, like a chunk of memory. So if you read the first bit of the chunk of memory, you very probably are going to read the rest as well. And uh, the CPU just grabs that memory and puts it in the, into the cache so that the next calls are very, very fast. So the good thing here is this is really fast, like three nanoseconds. So what? What's the, the loophole that we use in, in, in Meltdown? This is a load instruction. Uh, basically, you read something from memory. 
it has two micro operations. Check if the program is allowed to do that. That's the first operation. The second operation is get the data. Uh, the irony is, for both instructions, the CPU has probably go and fetch data from memory. So the, for the first one, it needs to get the page table entry, uh, which is the, the information that manages the pages I showed you, uh, and which contains uh, the permissions. So user space allowed, yes or no. And the second one is just getting the data from memory as you would, you know, want it. So like burger example, you order a burger and a coffee, the burger is ready, the coffee machine is broken, and so the customer doesn't get a burger and he doesn't get a coffee. So this is the case that you know, one fails. The check says you are not allowed to do that. And then the customer should not get his burger or his coffee. But this is not so. So this is a program written down, check, read, magic. Okay. Left side is the logical view. On the right side is what happens if the value is in the cache and the page table entry is in memory. That's not necessarily a precondition, but the value has to be in cache. So the CPU sees, uh, sees getting the data and working with it is the fastest route to go. And if I find out later that I shouldn't have been doing that, I you know, rewrite history and you know, abort the process or whatever. And this is no problem. Why? Because the CPU is very good at making, making things unhappen. As in the burger example. So unless you know the the blue one, the magic, does something that is not detected by the CPU or cannot be undone by the CPU. So in this case, um, the burger takes uh, the, the customer takes the burger and runs away. Well, that's that's not the design that that I had in mind when I designed my burger workflow, but that can happen. Well, this is a an attack. So we have two actors. One is a spy, and one other one is a collector. Uh, um, they both run in the same process. So we have memory on the right side, uh, a secret value, and uh, some memory blocks. The secret value can have the values one, two, or three, for the sake of argument. So the spy will read the secret. It will mark a memory block um, that corresponds to the value of the secret. Like in this, the secret is three, and it marks the block. Uh, it's a three. And then the operating system or the processor will find out that it shouldn't have been able to read the secret and will like, terminate it. But the mark still remains. And so what the collector does is, you know, it just looks until it finds the mark. It's block three, so the secret is three as well. So how does it work like in, in, in the real world? The secret is in the cache. The blocks are not cached. Spy and collector can access the blocks, and neither can access the secret because well, that wouldn't make any sense to you know, launch the attack if you can just read the memory. Okay, this is two. The spy will read the secret. Depending on the value of the secret, the spy will access slash mark one of the blocks. By accessing one of the blocks, it will be pulled into the cache automatically. 
Uh, now the CPU finds out, okay, bad idea, kill that. But the block is still in the cache. That's the side channel. So what the collector now does is, you know, it accesses all the memory blocks. And lo and behold, one block is much, much faster to access than the other blocks. And that's the mark. And so the collector knows the secret was three. So it's important to, the content of the blocks, of the gray wall blocks, is not relevant. It's just the, uh, if they are in the cache or not. So that's how Meltdown works. I mean, it's, if you think about it, it's very, very easy. It's, it's not a difficult attack. But you know, the superscalar processors that enable that kind of attack, uh, Intel introduced them with a Pentium, like 1990 something. So, quick summary. Meltdown uses out-of-order execution of, uh, micro -opera of operations and micro-operations and uses side-channel attack uh, via the cache. This allows uh, the attacker to read all the, the kernel memory, which often includes all the memory of other processes. But the important point is this does not include the memory of the hypervisor or other VMs. Still awake or sleeping? Okay, at, at, at least one is awake. Spectre is, I will gloss over Spectre because Spectre is really spooky. Um, <laughs> Spectre is an attacking process can make a victim process do something without the victim process knowing what it does. So how does that work? Okay, basically the same, force victim to leak the secret, stash away the secret, get the secret. I'm just looking at the yellow one and from a very high level perspective. The yellow one works by manipulating the branch prediction of the CPU. So what is the branch prediction? And what is the speculative execution? Okay. This is me. This also. So, what will probably happen if the waiter sees me standing in the line? He will brew me a coffee. I didn't say a word. Maybe I just wanted a burger, but he brew me a coffee. Why did he do that? Because every damn day I get a coffee. And if the interaction between me and the waiter is like, take my money, give me the coffee, that's, you know, maximum throughput, compared to, I would like a co coffee, please. Yes, I will wait, and the other customers will wait also. Coffee done, okay, thank you. So this is a very good method to optimize. The problem is, if I don't want a coffee, um, the processor has to throw away that. You know, it's work that it shouldn't have been done in the first place. And that's the difference between Meltdown and Spectre. In Meltdown, the processor knows, like out of order execution, which, ex uh, which code to execute. In Spectre, it speculates, speculative execution. So this is a very complicated program. It has a counter, and uh, B does something that's maybe of business value, and C decrements the counter, D checks the counter, counter's greater than zero, great, go to B. Yeah, okay. This. And, you know, counter zero, continue. 
what the CPU, like at this point, will probably have recognized is probably the loop is going to happen. Because the last 50 times it happened, so it's safe to say that it happened this time. And as long as the CPU is, you're confident that it can undo anything like the B and C. Um, if it turns out that you know counter was zero, it's it's it's, a, it's the optimization. You know, it, it makes the processor run better. And the, the interesting thing here, here is where is how does the CPU remember that D always jumps? So we have two to the you know sixty four bytes of memory. Um, calculate. Na, 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 na. We, we cannot you know remember that for each memory location for each process. You have to use heuristics. Like if the virtual memory address ends with the zero five it's probably going to jump. That's a heuristic. It's a heuristic that's you know, used across all processes. And it works well. well the actual heuristics are you know, t trade secrets and probably much, much you know, more complex, but that's the idea. But as I said, the heuristics and the counters like does it jump or not, does it loop or not, are shared across processes. Means that if one process, say at the address uh, 55555, I don't know, 55505, whatever, you know, loops all the time. The branch prediction for that address will be loop check, yes. Another process that is, you know, something else, the kernel, mem uh, kernel, the hypervisor, that happens to use the same virtual address for, for a comparison, for, for, for loop instruction, um, will be influenced by the statistics for the attacking, or from the attacking process. Okay? It's like a bit... Uh, yeah, okay. Is that... Understandable. So the problem is basically shared state between processes in the processor. As programmers know, shared state is always a bad idea. Yes. So, and this is how how, how it works. Um, you prime the branch prediction, um, and then you make sure that the other process does something that it shouldn't do. So, what could it do? For example, um, in the kernel, like Linux, you have um, the enhanced Berkeley packet filter, which uh, can run script code, like bytecode, in kernel. So if you put some script code in your address space, it also is mapped in the kernel's address space. So if you happen to know where the kernel has like a jump instruction, and you can influence that to call the, the, the Berkeley packet filter interpreter to run the code you put into your process space, you can attack the kernel. Okay. This is really complicated. You know? And you have to know all the addresses. Like, where the jump instructions are, where the data has to go, whatever. It's really, really difficult. And this is why Spectre in the, in the first versions is not so much of a problem. <coughs> okay. This is basically the attack. You, sh you should be able to read that. It's, uh, the attacker controls X. And um, the attacker uses uh, every one to, to access arbitrary memory. So just ig ignore the if condition first. So the attacker puts in X, reads some, like any memory relative to the start of array one, and the value 
let's call it secret, that it reads, it uses to um, put another block of memory inside the cache. You might recognize that from Meltdown. It's exactly, exactly the same. What Spectre does is um, it prompts the branch prediction so that uh, the CPU thinks that X is always smaller errors at uh, one size. And so the CPU speculatively executes that, and I'm told to hurry up a lot, and so I do that. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But I'm, I'm There's another one. Um, and this is the attack that's actually really working, is um, the branch prediction can not only say, uh, does the loop happen, yes or no, it can also remember where the loop or the jump goes. And this is then the way to you know, run something completely different. So I will skip over that. Yes, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. So w what did we learn? W we have a, a management part on like, how to manage something like Meta and Spectre, and it's really difficult, and yes, I will hurry up. And we have a technical, a, a technical part. So for the first versions of Meltdown and Spectre, uh, my suggestion was, okay, play it safe, test the patches, and then roll them out. Because I deemed the patches to be high risk, and lo and behold, they were high risk. And, but the, you know, the problem is, you know, the slides are old, you know, like a week. Uh, oh, but <laughs> Who would have thought that? There are new, pa uh, new, new bugs. They are not, they, they should have been released like two days ago. Um, they will be released uh, in two weeks. Um, and the the bad thing is there's a Spectre variant uh, announced that is way, way more easy to exploit than the old one. And just remember, we have a lot of libraries that we put into our code. And patching these libraries like for bugs or continuous deployment might not be the best strategy to handle this attack. But just saying. <laughs> Inzo. Just shout. We have a, a micro. Thank you. Yeah. We have a microphone uh, troll. So if you have a question for Jens, <laughs> thanks for the talk. And sorry for cutting you short, but we wanted to get in a few questions. Any questions from the audience? Please, hands up. Yeah, up front. Pl sit, pl stay seated. Relax. Stand up. <laughs> uh, thanks for the talk. Um, Welcome. You didn't mention anything about performance issues. Um, if I fixed Meltdown and Spectre, how would that um, yeah, result in the performance? Um, I, I, I mentioned that at the beginning, like I, I glossed over it. So to fix Meltdown and Spectre, just talk about m fixing Meltdown, what would be the fix to fix Meltdown? Well, don't map the kernel memory when the user space is running. If you do that, um, you would look kill a lot of caching mechanisms, like the TLB uh, and the, the cache for the kernel memory. And that would make calls into the kernel very expensive, because they would basically run into an empty cache. So the, the point is, the more you depend on the kernel, like syscalls, the more like the fix for Meltdown will hit you. The fix for Spectre uh, that a Google devised uh, has um, not so much performance impact, um, but the numbers for Meltdown are like between 
5 and 30 percent. You know, that depends on the CPU, the operating system, and especially what you do. Another question? Thank you. Oh, excellent. Yeah, uh, thank you for the talk. And uh, I wanted to ask you, you mentioned that um, all modern CPUs are affected. So what about the RISC CPUs? And uh, when you follow the media, uh, for example, AMD CPUs mm, maybe are not as much affected as Intel or? OK. First, when I said all modern CPUs, I just lied to you. Um, the, the second question is, uh, I, I cannot really answer that because I honestly do not know, but a lot of these attacks are, for example, especially Spectre, are attacking CPU internals. So different CPU internals, lead to, you know, different results with the attacks. Um, my guess is uh, at least you know, the, the widespread server CPUs, uh, x86, uh, are all affected, uh, just the doesn't matter if they're from AMD or from, from, from Intel. Um, but that's, you know, for someone who's better at, you know, IT than me. <laughs> next next so, question. Sir. So you told that uh, we know that in, in, in uh, Meltdown um, addresses were in the cache and um, we can see if they are in the cache or not. So um, the only thing I don't understand is how, we get, how do, do we get the data so we can see if the address is there or not? But how we can, can we see, read the data? But we are not allowed to read the data directly. OK. Um, keep, it, keep it short. <laughs> very, very short, OK. Uh, these are you know, uh, three memory blocks. And I, I, I want to tell you that you know, number two is, well, the, the number two is a secret. So I would sit on that chair, I would get up, and you will feel cold, warm, cold, okay, number two. So um, you infer from you know, the, the protocol that we have devised, what is the hot chair, um, what the secret number is. So this only works if I could you know, steal the secret number from the CPU because of the out of order execution of you know, first give me the value and then check if I was allowed to do that. Was that clear? Yeah, yeah I'm bye. sorry. Bye, 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 Jens appear afterwards and he will explain it once more. Uh, the slides are available on that URL? Oh, oh, oh yes, also. F first, all slides are uh, open source. So if, if you want to use them at your company, at your, your university, or whatever, do so, please. I mean, it's a lot of work. And just for me, or oh, no, please. And the other one is. Is something missing? Boring? Was it awesome? Of course it was awesome, but <laughs> feedback helps. You know what's worse than sitting in a boring talk? Making the next audience sit in the same boring talk. <laughs> so please give feedback. I don't know if you have a feedback system here. If you don't have one, the sources are on GitHub. And I just happened to have opened an issue called feedback. So just comment there. Thank you. Thank you once more, Jens. Thank you very much. <laughs>